Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Bienvenidos. My name is Juan Pérez Miranda, Vice Rector for International Affairs here at Francisco de Vitoria University. I am representing the Rector in these welcoming words. Uh, the Rector will be present tomorrow morning. Uh, today he had an appointment outside, so it's, it's my pleasure to, to welcome you uh, in our institution, which is a young university. We will be 25 years old next year, so quite young, because universities are used to measure their age in centuries, so we are quite young. That's why maybe we are so like uh, active in many ways. And, um, and, and, and this is also a reason of pride, because it's the first time we, we host a meeting like this, which, uh, well, is like the 27th edition of this colloquium on violence and religion. And um, we are very much interested because of our mission and vision uh, about this like humanistic per perspective or profound perspective within current society, well, maybe has been forgotten. So we believe in this kind of profound dialogue. And, and for me, although I am Vice Director for International Relations, I am a medical doctor by training, and I discovered the mimetic theory and René Girard in a trip with Angel Barahona, we were traveling in a plane, in a long, long, long way. So if you travel with a philosopher, probably he will speak about <laughs> philosophy. And for me, it was a discovery. And after that moment that happened two years ago, I started reading, reading things about René Girard. And this, uh, like mimetic theory, is fantastic, fantastic discovery, because it can help you explain many things that happened in your surrounding, and maybe hinting like ways for a new dialogue. So it's fascinating. And even a doctor can understand this philosophy, at least uh, like a, um, uh, well, uh, a newcomer to this. So, so I congratulate you not only on the effort of, com of coming here, of putting all this program together, but about the interesting topic and the message that you are uh, put into this society, which is probably full of more conflicts than, than we would like. So welcome. Feel free to interact with us, the members of University of Francisco Vitoria. Feel at home and, and enjoy this meeting. Again, thank you very much. And I, I give the floor to David Atienza to introduce the speaker. Thank you very much. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. It is my pleasure uh, to break the ground from this conference that is historical. First time in Spain uh, that we have the cover. And I'm very happy to be the one I don't deserve it. I don't know why I'm here, but I'm happy to be here. Uh, I would like to introduce you, uh, uh, Professor Sandra Goddard, that is a professor of English and Jewish studies at Purdue University in the Department of English and Director of the Religious Studies Program in the School of Interdisciplinary Studies at Purdue. He's the author of six books on literature, philosophy, Jewish studies, and so many essays, more than a hundred. So I cannot mention all of them because we only have one hour and a half. Uh, so we have to go ahead. Uh, Professor Gooder is a founding board member of the North American Levinas Society. Uh, he's the former president of the Colloquium on Violence and Religion of the COVER. Uh, he, he served from 2004-2007. And for those who are familiar with, uh, since this is a refreshed, refreshed uh, session on the theory, I think for those who are familiar, like me and many others here, uh, will be a pleasant one session. For those uh, who are not familiar with the theory, this is a great opportunity to, to have Professor uh, Sander with us to be introduced in this topic that really, uh, even though it's not w well known, I'm anthropologist and the anthropologist has a great resistance to Girard, but it's not the moment to talk about it. Uh, it will be fundamental for the 21st century. Uh, just a technical thing, the board, uh, uh, the board uh, advisory board of the cover is not here because they are in a meeting right now. So these first rows are free for those who wanna be closer to us we are not dangerous. <laughs> so, thank you, Professor. Thank you, uh, David. Thank you to the first speaker whose name I don't know. 
Oh, okay. Uh, I'm, it's, it's a great pleasure for me to be here, and uh, I want to welcome all of you to what could change your life. I mean, could change your way of thinking about everything that you do. And so it seems to me that to, to start what we should do, we have an hour and a half together, we should just introduce ourselves to each other. Uh, so I'd like each of you to, to stand up or, or rise a little bit and look around and, and say your name and say what brings you here today in a half a sentence. Is that, is that fair to do? I, I think because you will make friends in the, in the next couple days who may be your friends for the rest of your life. Uh, and that's, that's been my experience with uh, meeting the Girard. Someone said this morning in, in the, uh, the board meeting that they've, they've never seen uh, an organization as interdisciplinary as the Girard organization tends to be. So maybe we'll start here. Uh, just say who you are and, and what brings you here today. Yeah. Thank you. So you see how widely diverse uh, people are who come here from all interests, all approaches, uh, some accepting, some, some thinking he's flawed in everything he's done. Uh, but one, one, one is tested here, to, as someone said. So let's, let's start with the sheet that I handed out to you. Uh, Girard has three main ideas. Uh, you know, most thinkers, great thinkers have one. Girard has three. Uh, so I think that's quite extraordinary right at the outset. Uh, the, the three ideas are, of course, of course mimetic desire, uh, sacrifice and the scapegoat mechanism, and scriptural reading. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one. In 1961, uh, Girard wrote a book called Mensonge Romantique et Vérité Romanesque, which was translated into English by Ivan Frichero. The title was Deceit, Desire, and the Novel. It was about five European novelists, Cervantes, Flaubert, Stendhal, uh, Proust, and Dostoevsky. Right? And what he argued there was absolutely counter to the romantic thesis that desire is original. He, he argued that desire is borrowed, that desire is appropriated, that all important desires are taken from the other. They're not, they're not taken from need, external need, and they're not taken from internal inspiration, which were the two sources of romantic thinking about desire. But they were borrowed from other people. These, we learned these as children, but we continue to do this as adult. And from Girard's point of view, this led all these major writers into an insight regarding violence and conflict. Because insofar as I, as I choose someone else to be my model, and we'll talk more about how that modeling process takes place. Uh, they may not like that I choose them to be a model because they may be choosing me as a model or they may be choosing someone else and resent the fact that I'm, so you can see potential tensions arising immediately from borrowed desire. And what Girard proposed is that each of these writers in some way and they, they each do it somewhat differently, saw the problem of mimetic desire as leading to violence. And, and each one, you know, and, and Gia told me, I mean, I was one of his early students. I think I'm number five. A Andrew McKenna should be here. At the, I think he's number two. Eric Gans is number one. Uh, Joe Harari was number, th was number three or four. And Eugenia Donato was three or four. And I'm five. So, so I was, I, you know, I went and I was the first student at Buffalo. So we, we used to have a lot of conversations, and Cesario Bandera was there, and we would all talk together about Shakespeare and and Moliere and and uh, all of, all of these uh, topics. And, and what Gia said is, look, uh, I was writing, I was writing Mensonge Romantique, uh, which means, you know, it translates as novelistic, uh, the romantic lie and novelistic truth. Mensonge Romantique et Vérité Romanesque, novelist, ro romantic lie and novelistic truth. Um, and I was writing this book, uh, and all of a sudden I had a kind of conversion experience. And Jim Williams writes about this in, in one of his, his texts. And I, he, I said, I thought I had a little bit of cancer on my, my head. And, and, uh, and then, w then when I realized that it, I, I was okay, I mean, I, I had a little operation and I had it removed, and I felt there was a grace involved, Gia said. And so he then said, I saw in each of these writers on their deathbed, uh, a conversion experience that was like the experience that I had. So he's identifying with these writers themselves and seeing something going on in their work that, that frees them from what he will call the prison house of borrowed mimetic desire. 
Okay, so I'm, there's a lot of stuff to cover, so I'm going to go fairly quickly, and, and we'll stop, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to get this done quickly so that you can then ask questions, because I'm sure you will have lots of questions to ask about this. But Jia could have gone on uh, with other writers than these five that I've mentioned. He could have talked about Moliere, as eventually he did, or talked about Shakespeare, as eventually he did, and perhaps uh, other writers as well. And he would have been known as a terrific writer for just that kind of work. He asked a different question. Uh, Girard uh, said, how did we get into this mess? What brought us here? How, how did this happen that we were here? And he began to read Greek tragedy. And this was the middle of the 1960s. And he was reading Oedipus. And he was teaching the novel. In fact, there's uh, uh, Mark Ansbach, who you will also probably meet when at some point uh, has gathered all his essays on Greek tragedy on Oedipus. I think it's called Oedipus Unbound, if I'm not mistaken. And he has an essay, which I think is really the transitional essay, because the essay is from the novel to tragedy. I mean, and, and, and that, in some ways, is the moment at which he shifts from simply talking about uh, these novelistic writings to something that he notices in tragedy, which is that tragedy offers us a way of talking about the origins of, of mimetic desire. And the origins for him is failed ritual. What, what he will come to designate as the sacrificial crisis. What he recognizes, which is what was going on in Greek tragedy, is that all Greek tragedy, according to the theorist Peter Arnott and a bunch of other theorists of Greek tragedy, say that, that, that sacrifice is extremely important for Greek tragedy. And Giao said, OK, but, but we're seeing this because in some sense it's not working. And at the heart of sacrifice somehow is scapegoating. So he began to think about this. So this leads us to our, the second idea. Girard proposed in 1972, a book, in a book called Violence in the Sacred, the following thesis. And the thesis is that the sacred and violence are one and the same. <laughs> That's the thesis of the book, that violence is the sacred that has come down from its sequestered place outside and is running amok in the city. And that, and that the sacred is simply violence that's sequestered outside the city. In other words, they're not different. It's, it's, it's not a different substance of any kind, uh, but it's a different way of controlling the energy that in one instance we call the sacred, in another instance we call violence. We call it the sacred when it's safe, when it's outside, when it's put away from the, the polis, the city, in the, in the, to use the Greek word. Uh, but, but when it enters and, and runs wild in the city, as, for example, in the figure of Dionysus, uh, uh, then we, we think of it as violence. But it's the same thing. So this was a rather astounding thesis. So then the question was, well, how did we get into this particular problem where we can't tell the difference between what's violent and what's sacred? And he came upon what I think is the center, in my view, of his, his ideas. I'm, by the way, I'm just going to introduce a, a parenthesis, and you'll find that I I, I try to be linear, but I don't always succeed at being linear. And so I ha have these parenthetical, hypertextual moments in the middle. So I'm going to introduce and I'm going to give you the three ideas. And then I'm going to talk about limitations and misunderstandings and, and new vistas. And so you'll see that will be what will come after these three ideas. OK. So what he said is, I have to figure out how the sacred gets generated. And so I want to look at sacrifice. And he said, at the origin of culture, and this is really the heart of his thesis, is lynching. Say that again. The heart of culture for him is lynching. It's rather an astounding idea. Kind of blows you away when you think about that. That we may have emerged from animals. Hominization may have derived from our capacity to gather together and kill a victim. It's rather extraordinary when you think about it. But that's really where he's coming from in this. And that's where we'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. So the question is. Uh, how, how, do we, how do we begin to think about victimization or scapegoating? What is scapegoating? So sacri sacrifice uh, for him is the origin of what we think of as difference. He loved to quote Emile Benveniste, uh, who he said once gave a definition. I've, I've looked for it. I have not been able to find it. Maybe one of you can help me find it. He said, Benveniste defines the notion of difference. We know difference comes from the word pharaoh, to carry. But he says difference is carrying away from the sacrificial altar. So that difference itself, the very material that the French tradition, Marcel Moss and Emile Durkheim and others see as the fabric of culture, 
is already involved with the sacrificial and the anti-sacrificial. It's, 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 what is difference? Difference is boundary making. Difference is separation. Difference is the capacity to say this is this and that is that. See, you know, we do it all the time. We think, well, how, how is that an idea? I mean, it's just what we do, you know. But for Girard, that has to be that had to be invented by culture. And when that diff when that distinction between this and that breaks down, we try to assert that distinction. And the attempt to assert it continues the breakdown process. And so Girard invented a new word, and the new word was undifferentiation. So he talked about how in, in cult cultures that begin with difference uh, actually have a, uh, a, a very nice time. They get along. Oedipus comes out in the play and says, I'm Oedipus. Uh, we, have, we have a problem to solve here. There's a plague. I'm Oedipus, and you are Tiresias, so help me out here. And, and he actually says things like this in the beginning of the book that Donato and Maxi put out called Structuralist Controversy. So you can read Giard's little piece on Tiresias and Oedipus at the beginning of that, and also in the five essays that, that Mark Ansbach has reproduced. What, what Girard says is that we begin in difference, in respectful admiration and deference. I, I, I once gave a paper for the Eric Ans group on difference and deference. Uh, they're, they're kind of related, difference and deference in, introduces something of the sacred notion as well. Uh, but then, uh, what does Theresius say in Oedipus's play? Well, I shouldn't have come. Um, because why should I have come? Because I, you're not going to like what I have to tell you. What is it you have to tell me? Well, I'm not going to tell you. Well, I think you need to tell me. Well, all right, I'll tell you. You're the re you're the source of the problem in the city. He says, Tiresias, the prophet, says to Oedipus, and Oedipus says, "Well, since you say that, I'll tell you the truth. You're the source of the problem in the city." In other words, we immediately move from respectful distinction to conflict. And, and, but it's the same gesture. It's the gesture of asserting difference. Uh, I like to think uh, of, of violence in a practical way as difference gone wrong. Uh, I, I, I take the, uh, I give the following example when I teach this stuff in my classroom at Purdue. If I'm standing in front of the classroom, if I take Michael Elias and I, I, uh, I take my fist and I strike Michael Elias, and that would count as violence. I mean, I would be, you know, expelled from the university and, you know, be terrible, you know. But let's say after this session we have, we have a, a lecturer and audience uh, football game, <laughs> and Michael is on the other team, and I'm on this team, and I have the ball, and, or he has the ball, and we run, and my fist hits his chest with even more force than in this context. It wouldn't count as violence. It would be count as the game. So what counts as violence is, is, to some extent, not entirely, but to some extent context specific. There's lots more examples of that kind of thing. So I, w I, say, I like to say that violence is difference gone wrong. And that, that difference is violence working well, creating separation and distinction. That, that, and I think this, we're going to talk about disease. And it seems to me disease is an absolutely perfect context for, for talking about the breakdown of boundaries, cellular boundaries, for example. Uh, so uh, sacrifice has its origin in difference. And the process of undifferentiation is a process of the assertion of difference in the face of its inefficacy. The fact that it doesn't work doesn't stop us from asserting it. In fact, it encourages us to assert it all the more. But the more we assert difference, the less it works. And so it's a self-feeding process and self-defeating process, self-feeding and self-defeating. What happens if we continue this process of asserting difference all the more as it no longer works? Well, it, you know, it's one thing to say Oedipus and Theresias become enemies of each other, and they begin to look more and more like each other as they assert violence against each other. They become doubles. But what if that, that extends to Jocasta, the, the mother, of, turns out the mother of Oedipus, or to Creon, the, the, uh, the brother-in-law of Oedipus, uh, or to others in the play? Then you can imagine a situation that Hobbes might describe as the war of all against all. So the extreme version of this breakdown of difference is everyone becoming potentially, in the extreme, the limit case, an enemy twin of everyone else. 
right? That's a limited case, okay? And Girard talks about that limit case. So he wants to understand how can we get ourselves out of that limit case? That's what Hyman Hobbes talked about, the war of all against all. What do you do with that? Well, Girard said something very interesting occurs when the war of all against all threatens to take place. If everyone can be an enemy and a double of everyone else, then anyone can be an enemy and a double of everyone else. You hear the difference? If everyone can be of everyone, then anyone can be of everyone. What determines the movement from everyone to anyone? From the mass to the individual? Skin color, hair length, stature, size, age, everything by which we invoke societies for the prevention of cruelty to 70 year olds or society for the prevention of cruelty to people who limp or society for prevention of cruelty to you, you fill in the blank. Anyone that we are concerned about today who be, we think of as, as a, a victim in some capacity can become at that moment the absolute determinant. So I mean the great story that in which I learned this stuff is William Faulkner's uh, story uh, it's called Dry September, I believe. How many of you read Dry September by William Faulkner? Story? No? Well, a bunch of, of, uh, of good old white guys are standing around in the South, and they're just telling a story, and someone says, well, I, I heard that this, this white woman was, was raped. And someone says, well, you know, uh, old Joe, the black man, old Joe, is not here. And someone else says, we better go find out why he's not here. And then someone else says, well, we're, we're going to take care of this problem. And they go out and they hang old Joe. They kill him. And, and you never find out if he has any, re any relationship to what he did, or if the woman was lying, or if the woman, anything happened to the woman. You see what I'm saying? It's all, to some extent, a social process independent of, to some extent, empirical truth. Empirical truth becomes a servant and subservient to this mythic scapegoating process. And that seems to be an, an absolutely astounding idea. When I first started working with Girard, I worked on Oedipus. And it seemed to me I had always been taught in the history of, of Oedipus criticism, when I started as an English teacher, as a literary critic, that the play is about the discovery that Oedipus is, is guilty of parasite and incest. What I discovered is that Oedipus simply appropriates the view of Tiresias of himself, but that there's no empirical evidence that Oedipus killed his father. That, that the evidence is at, f at, be at best equivocal. He could have, could not have. But he, in, in the face of that uncertainty, he appropriates a, a view of the prophet and decides that he did, and that enables him to become Oedipus, whom all men consider great. Okay. So what is the process here of, of the movement from the war of all against all to the war of all against one? That's really the, the question. The answer is substitution. At the heart of Girard's work is substitution. Uh, the one who is not present, the one who is shorter, the one who is, whose skin color is darker, or the one whose skin color is lighter, or the one whose skin color is a different color. Uh, 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 or whose hair is different. These, all, these, all these meaningless and slight and accidental differences become absolute. And that determines and galvanizes the move of the culture again, of the group against everyone to, a, to the group against one. But what happens once that takes place, once the venting of that violence takes place against the one? What happens? Peace. The difference between violence a moment ago and peace now. And so what do you say when you, when, when, when you have peace now and violence among, well, this must have been the God in disguise. The God came into the problem and came into the human city and has gone out. Well, in order to preserve the effect of this, we better sacrifice a cow every year belonging to the, the victim whose hair was a little bit longer. He obviously was the God in disguise. And therefore, we're going to sacrifice his cows. Okay. And then that becomes ritual commemoration. So that, that the, the, the change is always double. It's always a moment of, of violence that issues in a moment of peace, that issues in a moment of a, a telling of, of ritual commemoration that gets repeated and until that system breaks down and there's a new fight between a new Oedipus and a new Tiresias. 
So there tend to turn out to be four stages to this process. And I've, I've listed the stages for you. Differentiation or, or the sacrificial differentiation, the process of the breakdown of difference, the sacrificial crisis, enemy twins, reciprocal violence, doubles. This moment of substitution or the paroxysm, the one and the many, the war of all against all become the war of all against one. And now, new difference, order. Okay, all right, so then Girard having, having done this felt that's not enough. <laughs> you know, I've, 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 I've evolved the theory of all culture and in the, in the ancient world and, and, and the Greek tragic world, how did we get into this mess? How, what, what brought us here? And the answer he came up with is Judeo, Ju, what he calls Judeo-Christianity, which he was willing to call the Hebrew Bible and, and the, Christian, the Christian New Testament, the Gospels. And what he argued is that, that scripture, and, and he, he just says, I read it because that's my tradition, but it, it's, it's equally available in Hinduism, it's equally available in Islam, it's equally available in Buddhism, it's equally available in all the traditions we consider to be revealed traditions, all of them. And it's absolutely important for Jia that this be the case. Uh, scripture exposes these, what he would then begin to call the sacrificial violence. And what, he show, what this shows is that the victim, from Jia's point of view, is always innocent. What is he innocent of? The victim is a double. We know a victim is a double. Girard loved to quote Dostoevsky, uh, who would say, you know, d in Brothers Karamazov, for example, Dmitri would say, uh, I am guilty of everything before ev everyone and me more than anyone. I think I got those three prongs right. I'm, I am guilty of everything in front of everyone and me more than anyone, right? Well, how do we move from that, that, that extreme guilt, to the sense of an innocent victim? Because the victim is not necessarily innocent in the sense of, of not being a double. The, the victim is, is arbitrarily chosen as double, but he's innocent of that with which he's charged, which is being the source of all the violence in the community. So Judaism and Christianity expose the innocence of the victim of the crime with which the victim is charged exposes scapegoating. In fact, the very word scapegoating means it's arbitrary. What we mean by a scapegoat is someone who is just simply being blamed for something that that individual has not necessarily done. So, in, in, then he cites the stories of Cain and Abel. Or how are we doing with the, thank, oh yeah, thank you. I get passionate. Yeah, it's also hot in here. If I take this off, will I, am I, am I gonna, oh wait, yeah, yeah. I better take this out of my pocket. Yeah. All right, I'm going to do that. I hope we're still, you can still hear me, right? All right, I'm going to take my jacket off. Nothing fancy, just my jacket. <laughs> yeah, okay, all right. So, uh, scriptural reading. Um, he proposes this in a book called Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, which translates The Choses Cachées Depuis la Fondation du Monde, which is a, a line that begins actually in the prophets and it, it recurs in the New Testament. and. Uh, he says, it, it, we, we can tell the stories, the movement from the story of Cain and Abel to the story of Abraham and Isaac to the story of Job. And then finally, Jesus, for him, is the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Jesus uses his body as a teaching tool in Girard's understanding. That is to say, here is where your violence is going. I'm going to show you where it leads. I'm going to allow you to take my life so that you can own your own violence in my acting it out. Even if it costs me my own life, I'm willing to do that. That's for him how he understands uh, Jesus. And it seems to me that the, the Christian tradition picks up the resurrection and says we, this has, there has to be a moment in which this is made clear. And so the resurrection becomes the foundation for understanding this, for taking the entire picture and saying, this is, this is what I, now do you get it? Now do you see where your violence has led? Okay, that really is the story in a nutshell. I've kind of compressed a lot of stuff, and there's a lot more to, to be said here. But uh, I, I, have, I, I always sense that I'm, we're, running, we're, we're about 1 o'clock, so we have about 50 minutes. All right, I'm going to just talk about some of the, what I think are, are the misunderstandings of Gira, and then some of the new vistas. So Rene Girard is not proposing an ethical system. He leads us to the door of ethics. It's a diagnostic system. It's a diacritical system. It's a descriptive system. 
but it's not an ethical system. And to me, that's wonderful because it allows you to do whatever it is ethically you want to do. You want to be a Christian? You want to be a Jew? You want to be a Muslim? Or you want to be a, a, a secularist you, um, and with, with, with an ethical orientation? It allows you to be ethical or non-ethical. In some sense, he's simply offering you a research tool, a description of the process with which you can, with, with which you can uh, do what you want. You can go with it wherever you would like to go. Uh, there's a big discussion. The, the first three are really, the, the, seems to me, the big three misunderstandings. The, the thinking that Girard is uh, uh, arguing for an ethical position. The second misunderstanding, it seems to me, is that the discussion about positive and negative mimesis, and I think this is largely from people who want an ethical system and find it lacking there, and so they say, well, we have to find a positive mimesis. Girard never tires of saying there is, there's only mimesis. That's all we have. There's no positive or negative mimesis. Positive or negative are the consequences of mimesis. They are not something inherent or internal to mimesis. If it works out well, the positive mimesis, then it works out well. If it works out badly, it works out badly. But what he's describing is the, the mechanisms by which culture tries to manage or create an economy of borrowed desire that's controlled through this mechanism mm -hmm. of lynching and sacrificial surrogate victimage uh, that from his point of view defined human cultures from the outset, from the be very beginning and it's of its separation uh, up to the moment when the scriptures in modern re religious context begin to expose the sacrificial mechanisms so that we can take stock of them, um, or so that we can choose not to. I mean, remember, I remember that uh, we had a discussion with Bandera and Shia. Uh, we said, well, you know, the truth is out. I mean, Judaism, Christianity makes the truth available. And he said, but you know, we're only 2,000 years into that truth. You know, we're going to make mistakes every day, and we, we could be four or 5,000 years more before we begin to get what it is that these scriptures are saying to us. You know, we've lived millions of years sacrificing others. So we're not going to, because we have a couple scriptures, suddenly we're not going to get it overnight. But it makes available nonetheless to us the possibility of living in some non-sacrificial or counter-sacrificial or anti-sacrificial way. So the problem of the modern is the problem of how to live anti-sacrificially. In ways that don't, that when things go bad, we don't immediately lurch into lynching, even at a small scale, even in families. Uh, I've already mentioned to some extent the third misunderstanding, which is that sometimes people think, well, because he says Christianity is about the innocent victim, that therefore if I, if I sign up to be a Christian, I'm, I'm now innocent. <laughs> right? It doesn't work that way. You know, it's just not how it works. I'm sorry. It, that's just not the, uh, that's not the deal. You know? Uh, you can uh, understand innocence only with relationship to what it is that you're being charged with. You know, you, I, you are the source of everything that's gone wrong in my life. Well, no, no, I'm just arbitrarily, you're choosing me for that. I'm not the source of everything that's gone wrong in your life. I, rem I, remember, uh, I remember when I was uh, having a, an argument with my uh, then ex-wife, and, and, and I came home and I said to my cat, you're the source of everything that's gone wrong in my life <laughs> to the cat. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, number four, Girard is not a theologian. This is a kind of important, actually. Girard is himself not a theologian, although he absolutely is fast. The, the, theologians are fascinated by him. Michael Kerwin, uh, uh, Nicky Vonnegar, uh, um, uh, James Allison, uh, 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 Father Schwager, Raymond Schwager, uh, they're all, they are theologians, and they draw upon his work, and they love his work, and they, they find it very useful. But Girard had never tired of saying, this is for the theologians to decide. I'm simply offering you the descriptions. You know, and, and he, would, he would talk about people like Lonergan, Bernard Lonergan, or, or people like Rahner, called Rahner. I mean, Father Schwager, Raymond Schwager, was the Karl Rahner professor. Uh, and we always, always had these discussions about Ranarian thinking in relationship. Because b why? Because they would introduce into theology anthropological concerns. What else? 
what else can I tell you? Okay, so number five, to me, and this is my own view, maybe other people will think differently, I think sacrifice is the, is the key to the whole thing. Uh, mimetic desire uh, is interesting to him, but he didn't stop with that. What he's interested in is where did we get this problem of mimetic desire? And we got it from the failure of sacrifice. So for him, it's sacrifice working or not working, and the, the Gospels, the Hebrew Bible is a way of understanding what it is that's going on within the sacrificial structure. So he's not telling us uh, that mimetic desire is one topic and then sacrifice is another topic and, 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 and uh, the, the, the scriptures are a third topic. They all serve the revelation of this story about the substitution of the war of all against all by the war of all against one. In some ways, substitution is at the key of Girard's work. Uh, just a little bit of a, I told you I'd, I'd do this parenthetical move, uh, just a little bit of a parenthetical move at this point. What do, you, what do you, how do we talk about victimage historically? Well, you know, we, remember this little model where uh, we're going to sacrifice the cows every year for this, because the, this victim that we sacrificed brought peace and, and we imagine it to be the god all along, and so we're going to sacrifice his cows. But then, you know, a community rises and said, you know, you can't be cruel to cows, so the community for prevention of cruelty to cows arises. So we said, okay, next year we'll just do cakes. You know, he'd like to make some cakes, so we'll do cakes. And someone said, well, you know, we really shouldn't use fire in that way, so we'll just say a couple bless. So we keep substituting victims for victims for victims until we have less and less violence. And of course, the more we substitute, the less efficacious the victim it becomes because the farther removed from the original primal scapegoating and killing that engendered this new understanding we become. Okay. Uh, where are we? Um, so, so violence, I said, is difference gone wrong. Uh, Girard never tired of saying that what he was doing was not theology, but it was scientific. He said, if you have a better scientific theory of how culture got started, propose it. Oh, it's fine. I'm open to things. But it's a theory of, of human uh, origins. That's what he's offering. It's a theory, and it's just a theory. It's just a hypothesis. It's one way of explaining. And there are other people who have alternative ways of explaining these things. So it's just a theory, and, but he likes to think of it as scientific and as anthropological or sociological. So it's not, as some members of cover have on occasion said in print, simply Christianity. Get used to it. <laughs> we had a member, no longer here today, but, but uh, uh, he's passed away. But he used to say, it's just Christianity. It's all it is. Just deal with it. You know? Okay, well, that's fine for that particular member. But Girard never spoke that way. I mean, he, he said, I'm just doing a description. And you can take it as a Christian, you can take it as a Jew, and you can take it as a Muslim, you can take it as, as a Hindu or a Buddhist. Girardi, Girardian thinking is not an essentialism. It's not saying what really is in this way or in that way. It's not about what's called in Greek ontology. It's not about being. It's not an essentialism. It's not really this or really that. What it is, is prophetic, extensional, serial, sequential, diachronic. I've given you the, some of the adjectives here. Uh, as opposed to synchronic, representational, analogous, relational. It's not about here, there distinctions but it's about ordering distinctions, about processes. Girardian thinking is an extension. How do we get from here to there? What's the process by which we do? We have a series of steps. We have difference, we have undifferentiation, we have substitution, we have new difference, and then that system goes through new difference, breakdown, and so forth, and repeats itself. So what we get here is a kind of social phenomenology. What we end up with, to use a philosophic term, is a social phenomenology. Uh, and it's not, a, and fi the final thing that I've come up with, and these are, you know, you may have more and you may want to talk about some of these things. It's not a form of political advocacy. If it's not ethical advocacy, it's not a political advo advocacy either. Right? It, he, you can have whatever politics you need to have. It do this doesn't say, therefore, I will be for Trump or against Trump, or I will be for Hillary Clinton or against Hillary Clinton. I'm using my own country's, country's references here, of course. It's not an advocacy of one kind or another, as, uh, as, as, as some people sometimes argue. 
So what are the new vistas for Girardian thinking? The new vistas, and I've just given four, and, and you've heard a number of them today already. Uh, people are working in these fields. Harmonization and the ethical. Eric Gans has this idea of, of the primal scene and that language is available at the primal scene and that somehow language enables us to stop and somehow that stopping provides the ethical, capaci the ethical capacity for us to go on as a culture. So he's trying to introduce the ethical at the moment of harmonization in his th theory. Father Schwager talked about original sin. In some ways, he's doing something very similar to what er Eric Gans was doing, because he's trying to introduce the ethical at the moment of harmonization. There, you know, if you read this wonderful book that, N that Nikki has put out with uh, Matthias uh, Moonbroker, am I saying? M Moosebroker, Moosebroker, uh, where they, they put out the correspondence of René Girard and uh, Father Schwager. It's clear that for Father Schwager and René agrees that there was a choice be made, but the choice at the moment of homicidation, a choice is already made. And, and Schwager says, how is that different from original sin? And it seems to me it's an interesting question, because what it's doing is introducing the question of the ethical even at the moment of harmonization, which doesn't mean that, that one, one can blame or not blame uh, for being ethically right or wrong at the moment of harmonization. What it means is that the capacity to be sacrificial all, already, in some sense, introduces the capacity to not be sacrificial. The ethical is after, what is the ethical? The ethical is, is the ability to stop. The, the ethical is the ability to not do. I mean, you know, this is, this is known by, uh, by Montaigne, right? In the essays by Montaigne. It's the ability to not, the, he, he has an essay called The Virtue of Not Doing. The virtue of Not Doing. In, in Judaism, we speak of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is when you desist from doing things. Another area in which uh, Girarding thinking has been recently developed is the ecological and the elemental. And this discussion not simply having to do with policy, but having to do with the very capacity to think about ecological context. And, and you'll meet uh, Joachim uh, Adundum here, and he's been working in that realm. You've heard already a number of people talking about film. Uh, Girard himself virtually never talked about images. I don't remember one discussion of René Girard and images. Yet, yet it's flourishing today. Joel Hodge, Joel Hodge is putting together a book on, on film. And there are, there are other volumes out there that I've heard about. There are two or three volumes already on film and Girardian theory. Girard never talked about images, but movies are, are moving images. So there's, there's work to be done in that context. There's work to be done with regard to medicine and biology because for Girard, the capacity to, to imitate or not imitate is, is, comes with cellular development. I mean, Girard used to talk about this research that we once, one of the seminars we discovered, which I, and I, I, may, I may be getting it wrong, but the, but the idea is that if, if, if there's a process of gestation taking place and you have some cells that are forming eye cells, for example, eye cells. And you take those cells and you move them to another environment in which there are kidney cells going on. Those potentially eye cells will become kidney cells. And according to this research that he was reading, it's by imitating the cells in the environment in which they are, are, are located that this takes place. So that there is a kind of a hint. I mean, I may be simplifying, I definitely am simplifying it. But uh, there's, it's kind of a hint that there's a mimetic process that may take place at the cellular level. I've always thought myself that cancer is the breakdown of the body's ability to maintain difference. And, and, and what we call metastasis is simply the failure of cells to, to imitate properly the, the environment. And they show up, but they show up as lung cells showing up in, in kidney cells. And, and we call that metastasis, right? We've got lung cancer cells that show up here. But maybe if, 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 the, if the system was working properly, they would become kidney cells and not simply lung cells. So to some extent, disease may be the breakdown of sacrificial difference and gendering processes. Anyway, I'm going to stop, um, and I'm going to open the floor to questions because we have about 20 minutes left for our questions. Yes, do we have a mic? Maybe we have, perhaps someone can give the mic to this individual. Yeah, thank you.
Thank you very much for that. I just want to very briefly uh, go back to my thing, which is law and literature, mm -hmm. and revisit very briefly your account of Dry September by Faulkner, yeah. which is about a, the spontaneous formation of a lynch yeah, mob. I, I may have gotten it wrong. No, no, that, that's okay. That's okay. You, you right. Yeah, yeah. And <laughs> uh, link it to the two novels that he actually spun it out of, uh, yeah. Light in August and the Dust. Good. Um, I think one of the, pr the your account to me highlights the parts of Jordan theory I don't like and I disagree with. Mm -hmm. Although scapegoats can be chosen on a purely arbitrary basis, as in Shirley Jackson's story, The Lottery, for example, which I think right. someone is giving right. a paper on, the victim chosen in Dry September is not arbitrary. Mm -hmm. He's a black. Right. I mean, in other words, the we're choice, we're always within the process. The choice is right. always loaded in advance. Yeah, right. In other words, right. here what we've got in dry right. September is not so right. much that right. let's make a black man a scapegoat. Yeah. Right. Rather, it's we need a scapegoat. Let's choose the black man to be it. Does, does that? Yeah, yeah. The scapegoaters never say that we're scapegoating. They never say, right. hey, look at this, we're scapegoating. Yeah. That's just not a, a discourse that scapegoaters engage in. Do you, f yeah. perhaps, as a valid criticism of Girard, that he pays insufficient attention to material particularities. He talks about that all the time, though, in, in the seminars. I mean, perhaps in, in the popularization discussions, it's not as clear. But okay. it seems to me he used to talk all the time about it. We, we always find ourselves within the situation. You know, it's, you know, what he's talking about is our cultural origins and cultural limit points and cultural models. But we find ourselves within a situation in which we have categories like the sacrificable, uh, you see what I mean? If it's arbitrary, how could there be a category like the sacrificable? How could we say that uh, in, in, a, in a culture of people who walk in a certain way, those who don't walk in that way are sacrificable? I mean, we, but we know that to be true because we know that lameness in Greek culture was one of the reasons that Oedipus could be, have his legs bound and, and put off on the mountain. You see what I mean? So uh, blackness in a, in a white, so I say white Southern culture has, has an already the valence is already built in. But that doesn't mean that there's not a sacrificial process that in some way engendered this that is failing and that therefore we're reasserting in the face of its inefficacy. So it's not that he, he's standing outside and saying, this is this and that is that. What he's trying to understand is the process of undifferentiation, the process of sacrificial breakdown. This is not an efficacious process for some reason. And what he's asking is, why is it not efficacious? I think Faulkner was asking the same question. Why is this not efficacious? Why, is, why do they keep doing it and it's not working? Yeah, Nikki. Can you add something to that? I'd like to, to add to, uh, to Sandy's response. Um, I think uh, Gerard, on the one hand, in the scapegoat book, he, he names those signs of the potential victim. Yes. Um, and I, uh, wha what I think he means when he says the choice is arbitrary is that the reasons given for the choice are not the real reasons. In fact, they're not reasons at all. Yeah. Um, he makes one exception, though. I think uh, he says Jesus of Nazareth was selected as a victim, not arbitrarily, uh, but just because of his message, because he uncovered the mechanisms. Th somehow the mechanism hit back on him. So maybe w one can see the, the differences between the arbitrary or non-arbitrariness. I don't know if Girard actually said it. Maybe it's just Schwager who said it. Uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it comes but from a Jewish idea called chosenness. Okay, yeah, but, but for Schwager, that was an essential difference between yes. the victims in general and, and Jesus as a victim. So yeah. probably it's Schwager, not Girard, yes. <laughs> Michael. Addition. I think in one of the books, Girard also said that uh, the victim is also chosen because it's always a person that cannot be uh, revenged. Revenged. That's yeah. nice. I like that. It's the unrevengeable. Yeah. yeah. We can't take action against this individual. Yes. I have two questions on different topics. The first one is on. Uh, and differentiation. Yeah. Um, Franci Francesco Ramotti uh, wrote a book, uh, Lo Sessione Identitaria. And there uh, he says that um, in our times, uh, building identities quite quite important becomes an, an obsession. Mm -hmm. So at some point he says, um, well, one of the options not to continue with this is 
probably renouncing to uh, identify himself. I don't know what would say Girard on that because I haven't uh, found it. And the second part is when you were talking about ethics, on uh, not not decide to do something, but I think that uh, to decide to not do something. Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the thing is the reason because you talk about the Shabbat, yeah. not doing something. Right. Shabbat. But th th what is the reason for not doing on Shabbat? Is, uh, because but see, you can. We would lodge ourselves within because Judaism. The reason is commandment. Commandment says that you shall observe the Shabbat. Yeah. Well. Uh, yeah. Uh, because we also in. Uh, the original is uh, because you can get stoned if you don't respect the Shabbat. So uh, yeah. it's not only mm -hmm. deciding not to, but the reason why do you s uh, for not deciding to do something. I mean, these come up. These come up directly. I mean, you know, I think of John eight, right, uh, which I've written about, and they, the Talmudic scholars, uh, say, teacher, rabbi, rabbeinu, a rabbi. We've, we've found this woman taken in adultery. We've taken this woman in adultery. What do you say? And he recognizes that they're trying to find, through her, him to be unfaithful to the Mosaic law. And so what does Jesus do? He stops. He stoops down. He, do he doodles. <laughs> People say, you know, he's, he said, what's he writing? Is he writing Leviticus? What is he writing? Laws? He writing he's doodling, you know, he's, he's writing in the sand. I, what I love about that moment is because he's doing what, what the prophets say. He's doing what Jeremiah said, which is that the, the, the truth is written in, in the sands uh, of the blood. And he's trying to teach by moving the sand around. What is sand? What is sand? It's the future of stoning. It's the future of stoning. He's pointing, he said, this is where your violence is leading, to the sand. The language of the covenant is the language of violence. Stars in the sky, the sand, the grains of sand on the, the sea, and the dust of the earth. Those are the three ritual formulas for, for the covenantal language. Well, what is the sand? The sand is the future of stoning. The stoning, where did it lead to? It just led to beaches, you know? It led to a lot, of, lot more beaches. It didn't lead to the stopping of violence. Do they get it? No. And so, so he has to stand up and say, well, okay, he who, is, he who is alone without violence, let him be the first one to cast the, the stone. He doesn't say cast the first stone, but it says the first one to cast. That's very important. First one to cast the stone. Why is that so great from a Talmudic perspective? Because Talmud says you have to have two witnesses. <laughs> you can't witness against yourself. So if anyone says, well, I am without sin, that we, you know that they're, they're not reading Talmud. <laughs> So it's a kind of, it's a test. It's another test for the Jesus doing. So in other words, the, the scripture is a reading of the sacrificial behavior of others, trying to get them to take acknowledgement of their own sacrificial behavior. I think, uh, oh. Oh, so I'm sorry, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, sure. I think uh, uh, that maybe you undervalue the ethical dimension in Shirard's <laughs> There, not the. I, I, I'm making room for Levinas. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I completely agree that it's not an ethical theory. But yeah. if you think of, in its raw and basic form, sacrifice, it's that humans can't handle violence. It's a way of. It's in its infancy. But what is uh, violence? A thing? Is violence something, or is violence not simply a category? by which difference that no longer works gets named. See, I'm not sure that there is violence. It seems to me, I, I mean, I'll, another example that I gave before, it, it, you know, a woman is stripped of her clothing. She's brought into a room where she's tied down to a bed. A man with a knife comes and plunges a knife into her stomach. Is that violent? I think most of people would think of that as violent. Well, what if it's a doctor? And he's doing a cesarean, and she's having a birth, and he's saving her. Listen, I mean, so the context is very important here for how this operates. And what we count as violence may be simply context-specific. Context-specific. It may be a way of, of lodging us within the structure of dry September so that we can say, okay, it's a black man, or it's a white woman, or, or it's rape. You know, it gives us the sacrificable... <coughs> categories by by naming those things yeah Nikki. Um, here i actually would also argue with you yeah. i would say you even if, if the doctor do it, does it it's violence yeah. 
although it's it's uh, well, it's a legitimate violence, especially if the woman has signed before the operation. And of course, for, for Gerard, it's uh, the the, the victim, the, here, the dead I'm body sorry. is is the, the fact yeah. that does not allow an alternative truth, but it's the truth. There is a dead body, and therefore, I would also say the violence that killed the body. Uh, is is definite. The, the, of the course, it, it, yeah. to to recognize yeah. it is context dependent. That, I would that, agree with that. Yeah, that's why I, that's why I say I'm going to say in my talk with with Wolfgang uh, later on that we live in a time that has to be defined from my own perspective, and this is a post Girardian idea as posthumous, as after death. It seems to me we we are necessarily after death. It can be in a Christian context or it can be in a context of trauma or disaster, but we live posthumously. We find ourselves in a place where, from my own personal perspective, uh, the cogito, the way in which I assure myself of my existence, is say, I died, therefore I am. It's not, I think, therefore I am, or I feel, therefore I am, or I suffer, therefore I am, or God exists, therefore I am. All the scholastic and the romantic and the Cartesian and the ancient Greek ways of looking at it. No, after disaster, I died, therefore I am. Uh, 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 Charlotte Del Beau says in Holocaust Studies, I died in Auschwitz and no one knows it. Yeah, I saw some hands. Yeah. You said um, that Girard's theory wasn't um, a theory of human origin. Yes. And you said there are other theories. I think there are, yeah. So really what I wanted to ask you is, when you have an alternative theory, what's, what's the next step? Do you just leave it that there are, there are two theories, or do you, what do you do? I think what you do is what you do to, following the Girard model is ask which gives you more explanation of what we understand to be the conditions in which we find ourselves. What explains more? What explains cells and harmonization and scripture and Greek tragedy and the novel? You see what I mean? Do we have alternatives that can explain all of that and more and do alter other things? Yeah. I, I was thinking about your comments about positive and negative mimesis. Yes. Um, did Girard trust desire? It's a great question. It's a great question. I mean, there are cultures in which one tries to get rid of desire probably because it's thought to be untrustworthy. Other cultures try to divert desire in different ways. To be honest, I don't, I don't know. I, I once asked Martha, his wife, you know, when he was sick, before he passed away, if he prayed. And she said, if he did, he's not doing it in front of me, or, or uh, he's, he's not becoming visibly more religious at this moment. So he may be internally doing that, but it's, it's kind of hard to say what he thought about that. I know that he practiced, he was a committed Christian. I went with him. I'm Jewish. And I went with him, sat with him while he, he, he handed out the host in, in, a, in, a, in a Catholic service in, in Stanford. So he did what c committed Christians do. What he thought about desire, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. Desire is, for him, not necessarily bad. It's how you regulate the desires that you have. Yeah. And Shen, you, you didn't um, talk about um, Girard's um, selection of, I mean, uh, 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 Jesus being the one who uh, stops the, uh, the violence. I mean, being the exact, just like in the book, I can see Satan uh, fro falling from the sky. Am I... My question is, is something that lots of people, um, you know, um, who come sometimes from different traditions, uh, see something against Girard. When, when, for instance, they reckon, well, what about, and since you, you know, you knew uh, René, René Girard, maybe you can answer us, you can tell us. Uh, uh, of course, um, you know, René Girard uh, had had this conversion and was fundamentally, you know, a Christian, yeah. uh, yet um, wasn't he seeing um, in, in other um, confessions, for instance, the, the mystic dimension uh, of, uh, of, of being allowing 
some people coming from different traditions yeah. uh, stopping the violence. He allowed it all the time. I mean, we had a conference with Wolfgang in Berkeley where we, it was about Hinduism and mm -hmm. sacrifice. His book on sacrifice is about Hinduism. And, you know, he said there's more about sacrifice in the Mahabharati than there is in Christianity or in Judaism. He said, we have just, just I'm not sure that's what you're asking me. Okay, okay. What Girard said all the time was, il faut refuser la violence. <laughs> Cessez tout. Il faut, Girard, Girard said, it's, it's necessary to stop the, I mean, what does that mean to stop, how do you stop the violence? Ça la question, that's the question. How you do it, that's for us to figure out. Yeah, yeah but, yes. but just to, to, I mean, to finish with that point is that Simone Weil, for instance, she, she, she could see the different mystic uh, approaches in, in all the different um, religions she, she, dimensions. Uh, uh, who are you speaking about? She? S Simone, uh, Simone Weil? Yeah. Simone Weil, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, wasn't he seeing the possibility of, of you know, uh, other people in different religions being yeah, able to have that? Absolutely. He, so he, s he loved Simone Weil's work. But he loves, what he loved in Simone Weil is the fact that she could look at Greek tragedy in Antigone and find a moment in which she's appealing to simply that this is a brother and I need to give, relate to this individual as one human being to another human being independently of the, the distinctions that Creon wants to make with regard to the state. Now, there's a lot of controversy about Simone Weil because it, she did this thinking that Judaism had nothing to say about it and that somehow Judaism was part of the violence, so she rejected Judaism, although she never fully became Catholic either. Uh, but Giard liked her because he saw her as kind of announcing in advance the process by which Greek tragedy was moving towards scriptural reading which unmasked or demystified sacrificial differentiation. Yeah. Uh, so. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like to check with you. Yes. The epistemological. You passed. You passed. <laughs> uh, the <laughs> epistemological status of Girard's the claims. Epistemological. Epistemological. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, by that I mean, uh, does he does he really mean that he's looking eyeball to eyeball to the mechanism that makes human beings stick and that makes human beings get incarnated into a society? Does he, th he, he think that he does, yeah, he does, he he does. Think that these are universals? And then if he, if he, if he does so, yeah. what is his claim to have? His, I mean, the last lecture he gave at Berkeley, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, are you? No, I mean, yeah. I understand that his claim could be perhaps the phenomenological method that you have right, mentioned. Yeah, yeah. But then, of course, the mm, uh, phenomenology, as it, as it is applied in philosophy, is, is a method whereby one tries to make do with all kinds of preconceptions. Well, yes, and, and then and then yes and no. we see that yes no. uh, that Girard's works and are, are all steeped in in, 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 in in Western culture, right to the bone. So how does mm -hmm. the, never denied that this? Yeah. Uh, do you see what I mean? Yeah. I find that the 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 deep problems in the epistemological department well, here. What is your you? name? What is your name? Vicente Miro. Vicente Miro. Where would we stand in which we wouldn't be immersed in some culture? You see, I mean, where, how do we gain exactly. a perspective that's not already exactly. within some cultural perspective? Absolutely. So what we do is simply take on the cultural perspective in which we find ourselves and lodge a perspective from within. So it's not a criticism to say that someone stands within their culture. But, but with, from within Western Christian thinking, and, and he had difficulty when I would raise Talmudic questions with him or Shakespeare questions with him. I mean, you know, I, I, I was the one who introduced, the, the, he had never really read Shakespeare before uh, uh, he met me, and then he read it, he, he, he debated C.L. Uh, Barber, uh, who wrote the great book on festive comedy. Uh, and he, he wrote, uh, he, the night before, he, he didn't know what he was going to talk about. He saw Mickey Rooney uh, in a version of, of, uh, of uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. And so he, he went in and talked about Midsummer Night's Dream. Or maybe it was James Cagney. No, I think it was Mickey Rooney. James and he, James, was it James Cagney? Yeah, yeah. And then, it, and then he talked about it. And C.L. Barber said, I've been teaching Shakespeare in festive comedy uh, for 50 years, and you've just explained Midsummer Night's Dream to me. 
So in other words, Girard had this kind of Midas touch about things, but he never denied that he was within the perspective in which he was operating. He would say, he called himself, I'm just an ordinary Christian, he would say. I'm just an ordinary Christian. I tried to get him to, to be an ordinary reader of, of, of Hebrew, but, you know, that was not his thing, you know. Yeah. Hi, my question goes in the same line, I think, like uh, Vicente's. Yeah. Um, I have a problem with the use of the word scientific for Girard's yeah. uh, theory. Yeah. Um, I think it's a little ambiguous. If you take uh, Girard's theory as, um, I don't know, literature, hermeneutics, it can uh -huh. be scientific, or in anthropology, or in sociology, but would you take his categories and you apply it to Shakespeare's and self-formation as well, I get lost. I mean, uh, we are applying almost metaphysical categories to biological. So if we, I think, if we mean scientific yeah. as Plato's metaphysics is science because it's episteme, then I agree. But do you mean science in the sense of something that is verifiable and falsable in the sense that contemporary philosophers use scientific? I what it know. means by science is an attempt to think about a process in which it's not the ult necessarily the ultimate truth, but that which explains more than other theories explain. So, so he would begin with Freud and say this explains certain things, totem and taboo, and, and Fraser, the Cambridge anthropologist, explains certain things, and Durkheim explains certain things. He said, I can explain more. It's a theory of difference. It's a theory of the origins of difference as, as, as in, within the French tradition, difference occupies this, this fabric status of culture. I mean, what, what is culture for Marcel Moss? It's difference. What, what, is, what is culture for Emile Durkheim? It's difference. If it's effervescence, because it's, it's, it's difference, in some sense, bubbling up. But it's for, for, so he's, he is operating very much within a tradition, but he's saying, I have a theory that explains more than other theories. Why don't we test, why don't we test it out? He's asking to, to have it tested out and to, to be thought of it. We're, we're, we may have to stop here. We're, are we? Uh, yeah. It's time. Thank you very much, Professor. Sandra. Thank you. One applause. Thank you. One, 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 final, one final word. I, I, I ask you to take your questions and go with your questions and engage other people and talk about this and, and then see if you haven't changed a little bit by the end of the conference for, for doing that. We'll meet you by 3.30 in the opening session, this same place.